Okay, so I guess I can start. Um, so uh, welcome to this uh, lecture on trusted computing. Um, so still Aurélien Francillon, so I guess some of, most of you were there yesterday already, maybe. Um, <coughs> so I'm not going to introduce my, myself again. So I've been working quite a bit on trusted computing. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's an important field, right? Uh, that's something that I believe, unfortunately, we don't use enough, uh, or we should use more. Um, but you will see, sometimes providing some properties, it can be good properties, things we would like to achieve and so on, but it's not always easy or simple to deploy, and it's not flawless, right? So many times, it's, there are many ways it can fail, and uh, sometimes it, it does. So we, we are going to, um, so I'm going to, to, in this lecture, I'm going to use the following flow. Um, first, briefly introduce the goals of trusted computing uh, in general. And then I'm going to uh, tell you about um, what uh, I would call attempts at doing trusted computing with only software, right? So uh, this, is, this is called software-based attestations sometimes. Um, and um, <clears throat> some people have high expectations for, for this. Uh, I honestly believe you can't really achieve good levels of security with this, or at least good security guarantees uh, by doing this only by software. I'll show you quite some examples uh, where how it can fail. Um, I would say at best it can be seen as an obfuscation mechanism or hardening mechanism, but I wouldn't really rely on it if I want to achieve some uh, good level of security. And then I'll tell you about um, trusted computing with hardware, uh, which I think is the way to go anyway, always. Uh, you should always, I mean, you, you can't do this without some hardware support, I believe. And uh, there we'll talk about static and dynamic, dynamic root of trust. And um, along the way, I'll talk about like desktop PC computers, right? Uh, so you probably know you, most of you may have a TPM on your computer, right? So in theory, you can actually use uh, trusted computing on your computer. I wonder if anyone's using it. No. Yes? You do? Huh? Oh, you use BitLocker. Good. So one user. Who's, who else is using BitLocker? Ah, so more people are using it. Absolutely. So some people actually use it without knowing. So BitLocker is probably the, I mean, it's the only largely deployed use of the TPM I know of, right? So maybe there are others I would be happy to know about. Okay, so we'll talk uh, briefly about that. Um, <clears throat> so uh, why, why do, you need, do we need, um, uh, so uh, yeah, I didn't really finish there, so I'm, I said that we're going to talk about this PC hardware, but we're going to talk about embedded systems as well, because uh, quite interested in embedded systems, and, and there is a lot more diverse, um, environment in embedded systems uh, where you can have some forms of trusted computing. So basically, uh, the need is very simple. We always need to, to trust computers or devices, right? You need to know if your computer is compromised or you would like, uh, if your phone is compromised, if your, I don't know, um, uh, thermostat is, com is compromised or whatever. Um, or your smart meter, uh, maybe. Um, unfortunately, um, looking at a computer, you can't really tell if it's compromised or not, right? So, uh, uh, some time ago, when you had some uh, malware, uh, you were noticing it, right? You had uh, pop-ups, you had, uh, like, the computer doesn't boot anymore, or reboots after 30 seconds, or some stone of spam, or whatever. Uh, but now, uh, the malware is not really much like that anymore, uh, very often, most of the time, I would say. Uh, um, um, for example, it's going to be um, trying to hide itself. Uh, we saw uh, some example of that. Um, it's going to, um, so if, if basically the malware or the rootkit or whatever is hiding itself, you will not know it's there, right? And you may have your computer compromised for a while. If the malware is well done, it's not going to crash too often. It's not going to like uh, show red lights or big warnings like that. So um, you, we need ways to detect this, right? Um, and to detect this, there, it's kind of an arms race. Um, so basically, <coughs> um, if you want to detect something malicious, uh, the best way uh, is to have higher privilege 
than the malicious thing, right? So uh, basically, you want your antivirus, if you have an antivirus, to, be, uh, to have a kernel module, right? If on that will for sure, or should for sure, allow you to detect user land malware, right? Uh, but if you have a kernel land malware, a kernel rootkit, then you have a kernel land antivirus module, um, and then they will fight, right? Uh, I mean, who's the strongest? I mean, San Andreas, it's difficult for the antivirus to be there before the malware. If it's there before the malware, it has a chance. If the malware is running already, it's pretty difficult. It's actually funny that if you look at, uh, for example, the recent Windows kernel, it signs all the code. And um, quite a few of the tricks that the malware is using to get into the kernel is used by the antivirus as well, right? So the, if you want the antivirus, sometimes they use a bit rootkit techniques to, to, uh, to install themselves in the system. Uh, and so sometimes it's even difficult to tell. If you look only at the, what they do, you could confuse a, a, an antivirus for a rootkit sometimes. Um, <coughs> and there have been examples of very powerful malware, right? So the kernel rootkits, there are no pretty common. We'll see some, some I'll mention a bit later, some, some weird ones. Um, there is this uh, virtualization, hypervisor rootkits. Uh, so there is this famous uh, blue pill rootkits, which basically are, it's basically, you can imagine malware, right? That is going to um, infect your Windows computer. And if you have a virtualization support in your computer, it's going to um, uh, get, sort of install itself below the, the windows. And it's going to virtualize your windows on the fly with rebooting, right? So basically, if you don't have an hypervisor already, it's going to take the place of the hypervisor, get completely below the kernel, right? So into this uh, ring minus one, uh, so-called ring, ring minus one. And from there, it's impossible to detect, right? If it's well done, um, it can get there. So for that, it needs to be administrator or needs to have a small kernel module, but this is pretty standard for uh, good malware. And, uh, and there, the, the malware is going to get into uh, this hypervisor level, and from there, you can't detect it anymore, right? I mean, there are some attempts, you could try to detect some side effects, but it's not very easy. Um, so uh, the boot sector virus, uh, that was a big uh, trend in this, like in the 90s. It was really funny to have boot vector virus. It completely disappeared and it reappeared a few years ago, uh, because basically a lot of countermeasures happened uh, in Windows, for example. Uh, there was these kernel signatures and so on. So to load the kernel module, you had to have your kernel module signed. And that was annoying for uh, the, the malware. So the malware basically gets um, to install themselves on the master boot record. So they get at the beginning of the boot of the system. And that way, they can deactivate the signatures from the boot. Right? Uh, so so there are, this is no pretty um, pretty used, um, used pretty much. You have disk backdoors, uh, so I mentioned that yesterday. Um, <coughs> uh, there is another thing, a bit like the VMM. Uh, there is a functionality in the Intel processors that you may know, it's called the SMM, System Management Mode. So this is a weird, obscure mode of your processor, right? Uh, some people call it ring minus two or three, something like that. So it's the highest privileged mode of execution of your processor. And basically it's used for power management on these kind of things. Uh, it's set up by the BIOS. Once it's set up, it's inside a protected memory region, right? On that protected memory region, you can't access, you can't see what's there. Uh, and um, when there is SM SMI, so it's system management interrupts, it gets to execute, right? And uh, once it's there, once the BIOS installed this, you can't know what's there anymore, right? So apparently, if you look at this uh, catalog from the NSA of exploits or implants from the NSA, if you read the, the catalog, you see that many of the implants they use is, are actually using the SMM. So many of the implants that we hide in the SMM, and from there, they can monitor the system. So again, this is the problem from the boot, right? On there, we would like to know what kind of software is running. So the whole um, thing about trusted computing, so it's been exi exist for a while, right? There have been like things like secure boot in embedded systems, which we'll see uh, for a long time. Uh, but there have been kind of uh, an acceleration of uh, activities. 
uh, because in the beginning of 2000, uh, there were like this code red on NIMDA. There were several uh, worms that were very damaging um, to computers, and in particular to Windows computers. And uh, Bill Gates actually made this uh, note uh, in 2002 uh, about trustworthy computing, right? And uh, so there was an email to the staff, and it's actually public. You can uh, I check, you can still find it on the Microsoft webpage. Uh, and that basically started. I mean, a renewal of this uh, trusted computing um, efforts. And uh, basically, if I'm correct, the TPMs on the T, um, trusted computing group and so on was created from there. And there have been not only this, but a big push for security at Microsoft. So um, that said, let's start with um, some attempts at trusted computing in software. Um, so the question is, we want to verify the integrity of systems. And um, we know TVRCs have been fighting malware for a while. Um, we, we would like actually to be able to um, detect compromised computers and having custom hardware for this is maybe not available in some systems. Uh, if you take the Macs, for example, they don't have the TPM anymore, right? So there is no way to do this anymore on the Mac. So they had before, but apparently it's not, uh, I mean, it wasn't used so much or didn't, they didn't use it, so it's not there anymore. Um, and uh, so you may think that it's possible to, to verify uh, the software by using software only, right? Um, <clears throat> and um, it's, it's kind of uh, complex to do this on a desktop computer because they are very complex machines, actually. So we'll, we'll start by looking at this, if this is possible on very simple devices, right? So we want to uh, verify the integrity of software by software only. Um, so we'll take this, those kind of small devices for which we exactly know the hardware, right? So we know uh, what's there. Uh, it's simple hardware. Uh, we assume that we exactly know the software that should run on them, right? So um, <coughs> we'll be able to verify if the correct software is running on them. And the software, software is going to be very small. Um, <coughs> and then, of course, we want to verify if the device is not compromised. So first, question, or first problem, what does it mean uh, to be compromised, right? Uh, so we'll start by assuming that compromise is uh, compromising code integrity, right? That there is some foreign code executing on the device. So from there, uh, what we want, for example, uh, we'll start with this, to do remote attestation. So we want to remotely verify the integrity of a device, right? We want to verify that the device has is running the correct code. Um, so we can do this with a simple protocol. So this is called remote attestation. So in general, it doesn't have to be by software. Um, and we have a verifier, one device or one server, if you want, that's going to send a challenge to another device, which is called the prover. And um, uh, this challenge, uh, the prover, is going to compute a checksum of its memory, some form of a checksum, right? Uh, and is going to return um, the response to the verifier, and the, the, the verifier knows the expected state of the memory of the prover, right? So knowing the expected set, state of the, the memory of the prover, you, you can recompute that the checksum is correct, okay? To prevent uh, replay attacks, you need to send a nonce, right? So you send a nonce so that each request is unique. And based on that, you have a protocol to verify the integrity of the code running on such a system. Um, good, so we'll do this uh, exam examples on uh, two small, tiny embedded devices. So there were devices I was playing uh, with during my PhD. So if you did some wireless sensor net, um, security uh, research, that was very typical devices. But they're very typical as well because they use two of the most largely used microcontrollers in the world, I would say. So one, the, the Telos B is actually based on MSP430. So this is a 16-bit microcontroller. Uh, so both are very small. They use a few kilobytes of RAM and flash, right? So they are very low-end microcontrollers. Um, the MSP430 is a very low-power uh, microcontroller, so it's used in tons of applications. So I was talking uh, to some people at lunch on that apparently use it for smart meters. So it's per, used quite a lot in smart meters, for example. Uh, it's used in plenty of applications. 
Uh, the Javier is kind of similar. Um, basically, they have similar specifications. They are very low on uh, microcontrollers, so it's a few, a few megahertz, right? Uh, eight megahertz, a uh, few megabytes, a uh, few kilobytes of memory. Um, typically, they are connected to Zigbee radio, so Zigbee is kind of a Wi-Fi for low, low power devices. Um, Zigbee is kind of is higher level protocol, but the Mac layer is the 802.15.4 uh, IEEE. It's kind of really uh, Wi-Fi for low power devices. Uh, I know it's used a lot. It's present in many applications. Um, so those were academic devices, but what's done here can actually apply to a lot of devices that you could call IoT, or, or, um, uh, for example. But the point there is, okay, if we manage to do software beta testation on those devices, then maybe we can look at more complex devices. Right? If we can't even manage to do it on those devices, there is no chance we manage to do it on a more complex computer. So uh, what remote testation would tell you, right? So you have a set of devices like that, and in some cases, you get a positive result of this challenge response protocol. So if you get a positive response, it means you can tell, okay, this device has its code not modified. So I can trust it, it's a good device, it's not been compromised. <laughs> if you don't get any results, the device is maybe dead, maybe uh, it doesn't answer, maybe you have a communication problem with it, you don't really know, or maybe it's malicious. Right? And if, um, uh, no, it's the opposite. If you have negative result, either it's broken, uh, not working properly, or malicious, and if you don't have a result, you don't really know. So the only result that is interesting is the positive result, and uh, we can't force a malicious device to respond, right? Okay, so now um, we look at how we can do this uh, by software. Um, <clears throat> so basically, software-based attestation, as I said, is the goal of being able to verify the integrity of the software using software, right? So it's kind of recursive, if you want. Um, so we can do software-based remote attestation, right? So we're going to remotely verify uh, the integrity of a device, and that device is going to only use software for this. Uh, you can see it as, as similar to doing some self-checking, right? Uh, so there is uh, quite some software that is protecting itself, uh, verifying its own integrity while it's running, even like could be Windows or Linux software. Um, that's used quite a bit, I would say, in games, right? Games that uh, want to prevent you from cheating. Um, it's used maybe, I think, software like Skype, for example. Skype is protecting itself to prevent uh, you from uh, doing modification to it on, on running uh, modified versions. Uh, so self-checking is kind of a general uh, thing. Um, but if you have a more complex computer, like Windows or Linux system, uh, there are very gen generic ways to bypass this um, uh, self-checking by using MMU tricks. Right? If you have user-owned programs, you can play with the MMU to, to make so that uh, the code that executes is not the same as the code that you read. So the software itself, when it's going to verify itself, verify its own uh, code, it's going to load, right? And this is going through the, um, uh, the data load, the data uh, cache, right? And it's not the same as the instruction cache. So if you know the, the, the PACS counter measure, uh, the NX implementation, the non-executable patch for Linux kernel, uh, the, the first one, they actually use this uh, trick using segmentation. So you can do the same thing to, to, to attack uh, systems, um, uh, self-checking programs in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Linux or Windows. There is a paper about that. Um, okay, so on embedded systems, so we don't have an MMU, so we can't do this trick. Um, we, have, uh, we can do this. Uh, the motivation is to do this on embedded systems that don't have any hardware support for attestation. And we can even try to do this on general purpose computers with the TPM. Uh, another motivation is that uh, typically a TPM is a chip like that, right? Uh, this is the kind of chip you have in laptops or desktops, right? But if you try to fit this into a motherboard of a, a smartphone, you see that it's already quite buzzy, so adding a chip is not an option, right? So if it wasn't planned from the beginning inside the, 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 the chip here, then you can't integrate this on the motherboard. The, 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 the chip vendors will, will not do it. So there are, of course, smaller versions of this for embedded systems. Um, but not adding a new chip is, is one of the motivations for doing software-based attestation. <coughs> 
So now, um, the problem in software data session is that, so we said we want to compute a checksum, right? Uh, we want to do this check, checksumming. Um, the prover has to return a checksum. The question is, do you just use a um, standard cryptographic checksum? Uh, that would be an option, but that would be too easy to cheat, right? The problem is not just to do checksumming, but it's to prevent some malicious device from, compromise, from computing a fake checksum, right? <coughs> because you have uh, it to compute the checksum over the whole memory, right? Um, so we need some tricks to prevent someone from cheating. Uh, the tricks we can use um, what we can use uh, is basically uh, tricks based on uh, the size, the, the memory. So the thing is, you can have malicious code in some free memory areas, right? And then you want to force um, you want to force the device to compute the checksum on this, right? Instead of just putting zeros, right? Imagine the, the memory is free at some place is zeros or f, right? Um, if you would have to compute the checksum over this, you could just instead of computing the actual checksum, just return values to the checksumming function without actually reading them from the memory. That would be pretty easy. To prevent this, um, we, we are going to uh, either try to use the timing or the memory limitations of the device. So uh, first, try to fill the memory. So instead, so we have a memory layout of the device, right, where we have the original program, and then there is some randomness. Uh, or if, if you don't do anything here, you have some free space, right? If you have some free space here, you could have some malicious code hidden here, okay? Um, while you compute the checksum of the memory, instead of computing the checksum against the malicious code, you would just add zeros, right? So if you, don't want, if you want to prevent someone from doing this, you need to fill its memory and basically uh, abuse this constraint that those devices have very small memory, right? So because they have very small memory, uh, you can't store um, the original memory here uh, elsewhere, right? So you don't have anywhere to store this memory. Um, so the idea is really to, to store this with randomness so you can't compress it, right? And then you can, if you do the, the checksum against the whole uh, program memory of the system, uh, then you know there is no room left for malicious code, right? And this is the idea. Um, however, if you do this, there is one problem, is that you can have malicious code that actually is compressing the original program, right? You can't compress the randomness, so you can't, you can't, if you write your malicious code here, then you are going to lose some of these random numbers and you don't know how to generate them, right? Because maybe you don't have the key to generate this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, those random numbers. So instead, what you can do is you can comp compress the original program and insert your malicious code here. And so you, you defeat the, 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 the system. And what you can do is you can actually, um, while you compute the checksum, you can just access this memory here and you can use this and you are not going to uh, compute the checksum over the compressed data because that will give you a different checksum, but you can decompress it um, on the fly, right? So it needs, it requires to have um, uh, an algorithm that allows this, but it's not uh, so complicated. And basically this way you can still compute the checksum over the original memory layout, right? But save some space for your malicious code. Uh, this is an attack that actually works for real. It's not uh, fictional. <coughs> so the second option then is, so we saw that like filling the memory and trying to prevent the, 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 the attacker from, from finding some space to, to store its own uh, malicious code is not working very well. So another option is to um, try to make an algorithm um, that is going to be very fast, one, uh, or running in some given time. And this algorithm is going to, to access the memory randomly, right? So the attacker can't hide somewhere. And if ever the attacker changes this algorithm, then, um, <coughs> then uh, it, it will have to change the code. And changing a bit the code is going to make an increase, uh, is going to increase the time of execution significantly, right? Um, <coughs> So uh, this is the idea, uh, and um, this is an actual implementation. So it's a paper called SWAT. Um, on, on this paper, so this is uh, AVR code. Uh, I don't expect you to, to read the, the code, but the algorithm is working like that. So you have a random number generator uh, based on RC4. 
Then you compute a random address, right? Uh, that is a one address of the program memory. Uh, once you computed this address, you uh, read uh, this address from, from the memory. And then you add it to a checksum, and then you do it again. So at every loop, you, you read one address, and you get one byte, uh, or one word of the memory. And uh, you, uh, you add it to a checksum. And uh, the idea is that this address generation is going to randomly pass the complete, um, uh, the complete memory of, uh, of, the, of the device. And if ever you want to have your malicious code somewhere, you will have to modify this address generation. For example, in case this address that is generated points to your malicious code, uh, then you need to change it, right? So you need to add a branch. Right? You need to check the address and to branch and do something else, like return zero, maybe, right? instead of the actual memory uh, location. Um, but if you do this, it's going to make uh, the algorithm slower, so it's going to take a few more instructions to make the loop. And in this algorithm, if you add one, two, three instructions, it's going to increase the overall time of execution of this loop uh, by maybe 5, 10, 20 percent, right? And if you add it by, if you increase the, 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 the time by this amount, then uh, you are going to detect that the response be arrives too late. So you re-measure the timing. <coughs> um, fine, so uh, first problem with this is um, we don't know what's the, the best code, right? What, what is the best implementation of this algorithm, right? Is it possible to do the same thing with five less instructions? I don't know. This, this was done manually, but I'm not sure you can do better, right? Um, second, what is the best attack? So you need to generate an attack for this, right? So if you, if you know the best attack, okay, it's to add three instructions, one that do a branch, Second, that um, reads memory and so on, and adding this in average adds that much time, right? So um, this is how to know what's the best attack. If you don't know what's the best attack, then you may not know, not be able to, to tell between some delay and, with, and between some real attacks, right? So this is problematic. Um, <coughs> Uh, but then there is a bigger problem, right? Um, the bigger problem is that, uh, so th there are attacks like that on, on this code. Uh, there are possible attacks like that. Um, <coughs> the bigger problem is that, uh, and that's not only the problem of this algorithm, is that if you do this, um, you actually, um, I didn't show you really the, the, how the device is working, but this device is a Harvard architecture device. And a Harvard architecture device has two memories one for the code and one for the data, right? So when we compute this address, we only access to the code, uh, to the code, we only check the code, okay? But um, we don't verify the integrity of the data memory, right? And that's actually a big problem. And um, one assumption in this algorithm was that if you attest all the code, then the device must not be compromised. And the problem is that there is this um, technique called return-oriented programming. So who, who heard of return-oriented programming before? Okay, who, so who heard of it yesterday <laughs> only? Okay. Because so yesterday there was this um, lecture on uh, software attacks. Um, so I was hoping that return-oriented programming would be uh, explained there in detail. It wasn't. But basically, return-oriented programming is like... Um, return to libc on steroids, where uh, instead of calling uh, functions, you just call chunk of code, right? And then you chain chunk of codes, and that allows you to control the execution, right? So you will only need to control uh, which piece of code gets executed, and you only execute code that previously exists in the memory. So how do you control this? You control it from the stack, for example. When you have uh, a few instructions followed by a return address, this return address is going to fetch a value from the stack, maybe after memory, uh, memory uh, stack-based buffer overflow. Um, this return address, uh, if you control it, you can point it to anywhere in memory, including some instructions, okay? And those instructions are a few instructions followed by a return address and so on. So um, I still have an illustration for that. 
So the idea of return oriented programming is that we don't do any code injection. So we don't inject any foreign code into the system. We um, on, do not call full functions. Actually, we could, but uh, it would be more tricky. Uh, we don't call any existing functions, and we execute chains of gadgets. And gadgets are those small chunk of code um, that are instructions followed by a return address. So imagine here, um, typical, a typical use of return oriented programming is to um, bypass the, the NX, uh, the non-executable uh, executable or uh, writable uh, memory protections that are not present in most uh, systems. <coughs> so to bypass this, um, uh, we, we are going to exploit a vulnerable function like a stack-based buffer overflow. When we um, reach this vulnerable code, uh, it's going to maybe overflow this buffer which is on the stack, right? So we have a simplified version where we have just the buffer on a return address. And um, the buffer overflow is going to overwrite uh, the buffer on the return address and it's going to write more stuff afterwards. Uh, so once we did this, at the end of this function that's been um, abused, uh, we're going to execute the return address from here. And this return address is going to fetch, um, so I see my animation broke, uh, it's going to fetch this um, first address from the stack. Okay, so the stack pointer actually uh, decreased, and the program counter joined, jumps to the chunk of code we choose, right? And then we can continue this, and then we move to the next chunk of code. Okay, in case we have a pop instruction, so pop is getting a byte from the stack uh, into a register. Then we have the stack pointer that decrease as well, so it doesn't work. Uh, but this instruction is going to, um, to fetch a value from the stack. So that allows us to control execution, right, plus load some values from the stack. So this is already pretty good. The thing is, um, we can do this forever until there is room in the stack. If we don't have room in the stack, we can use a stack pivot. So some instructions that modify the stack pointer on um, move the stack pointer to another memory location where we have another uh, ROP payload like that. So this is called a ROP payload. Um, so <clears throat> this, is, this is a technique that is very much used today. Uh, most real use exploits, uh, or even most exploits, do use this today, uh, because most systems have countermeasures uh, against uh, direct code injection. Uh, the big uh, advantage, I mean, the big difference between um, previous work on what's really called return-oriented programming is that um, it was found that, um, so there was some gadget chaining before, right? Um, the novelty with return-oriented programming is the programming world, right? Um, so Orav Shaham, that made this uh, first paper on this, noticed that uh, if uh, this set of gadgets, if you find a set of gadgets like that, that actually allow you to implement something called a Turing machine, uh, then you can actually do some real programming on top of that, right? You are not limited to, um, to uh, the existing code, right? You can express any, if you want, mathematical function, uh, because that's what a Turing machine allows. You can build a Turing machine. So this machine, you know, with a paper on, on a pencil and reading some, some values on a strip of paper. That's the theoretical machine. But you can implement a theoretical machine like that. And basically, it means you can express any algorithm, which means you can build a compiler, right? So you can actually build a compiler that is going to compile code not for AVR, MSP430, or Intel x86, but for a Turing machine that is expressed in a set of gadgets. Right? So your program is going to be written in the stack, program, right? And this is, if you want, you can imagine that those, this thing here is an interpreter, or it's going to interpret the program that you have in the stack. Right? So that's the easiest way to understand this. You can have your program written in the stack, which is interpreted by the actual instructions. On the instructions, they are the knowledge of uh, a given address in the memory on what they do, right? So the instruction is not going to be add. It's going to be this address, and this address has this effect on registers, for example. Based on this, you can actually program a system. You can actually make, so they, they made uh, example, so there are no compilers for this, right? You, you can actually compile. Uh, uh, of course, 
you will have to compile, if you want, the, the targeting code of your compiler is going to have to be specific to the program you're exploiting. Right? If you exploit uh, Adobe Reader, it's not going to be the same as if you exploit Internet Explorer, unless you really exploit a uh, library they share. Right? Um, <coughs> um, okay, so, so much for return-oriented programming. So if now we have this very powerful technique, right? It actually means we can have ma a malicious program executing from the stack. Right? And now, um, I told you before, on this processor, we have the code on one side and the data on the other side. On the code, we verify, but we don't verify the data right? because the data cannot be malicious, sort of. But so actually, it can. Right? So um, <coughs> we, um, we can imagine that. So this is the memory layout of of the system. So this is a Harvard machine. So it has a program memory on the data memory. Um, okay, it's not a big deal. Just it's executing code from here and fetching data. So here there is a, even registers mapped here, data, the stack. And uh, we have a program memory that is modified uh, by the malicious code. So we have a malicious system, right? So the system is compromised. We have bad code here. And then we have inside the, the system, there is this attestation routine. So this is the code that we this set of instructions that we saw that is doing this checksumming of um, uh, checksumming of the of the memory, right? So now uh, we put this small hook here, and whenever uh, you receive a attestation request, so like someone asks for verifying the integrity, uh, what we do is we actually trigger um, a return-oriented programming, or we actually uh, create uh, return-oriented programs in the data memory, right? and uh, we erase the malicious code inside the program memory. So there, we don't have any malicious code, and what is session routine is going to verify this code. Right? It's going to verify this, and this is uh, actually normal, unmodified. Right? And no, only the malicious code is, or malicious things, if you want, the malicious code is copied to the data memory, and uh, some return-oriented programs are, are stored in this data memory, right? Um, the thing is to be able to restore, um, we're going to restore once the attestation is done. So this attestation routine is computing the, the checksum over this. So like thousands of times this small loop we saw. And then it's going to send the challenge uh, response right, to the verifier. The verifier is going to verify it. The, the challenge response is going to be correct because we, it was computed over the correct, it was computed with the unmodified function over the correct program memory. And then at this point, uh, what we do is we can actually, uh, we put a small hook in the stack. And this hook is actually uh, triggering the execution of these return-oriented payloads, or the return-oriented programs, right? And this, those return-oriented programs, they are going to restore the malicious code. So basically, uh, we erased, uh, removed the malicious code, performed the, the um, attestation, and restored the malicious code. So I hope I didn't lose too many people on this. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is a, we can call this a, a return-oriented programming rootkit, right? Uh, rootkit, why? Rootkit is mainly, the goal of a rootkit is persistence on uh, stealth, right? So you want a rootkit not to be detected, and you want a rootkit to be persistent, right? So there we have the two uh, features. And then it provides some, um, easy way to elevate the privileges. OK, so uh, return-oriented rootkits, they are very powerful attacks. Um, so ROP is no standard. Uh, and there have been several uh, return-oriented rootkits uh, shown. Uh, there have been some on Windows, on the Windows kernel, for example. Um, and typically, so I think the, the most recent one, a student in the group actually uh, looked at it. Uh, on the ROP chains, so the chains of those instructions, the chain tens of thousands of instructions, right? Uh, so it's really, you have to, you, you, you can do this by hand on some small examples, but then you have really to automate this kind of attacks. But those attacks are actually working, uh, and they are uh, actually uh, pretty hard to detect, right? Because if you have, for example, the Windows kernel has some uh, self-checking uh, mechanism in itself, so it's going to verify its own integrity of its code, um, but it's not going to detect this. Right? Uh, uh, and this is a problem, right? Uh, because now we see that before we said, okay, a system is if a system is compromised, it means its code is modified, right? 
But now we see that uh, not only the code is modified, but if the data is modified, then the system, we can compromise completely a system by only modifying its data. And that means we need to verify the data as well, right? But um, if we come back here, uh, it's maybe a bit obvious that there is one pointer is that here that's been compromised, but maybe we could have compromised another pointer, right? Uh, there it was just a return address, but it could be any pointer somewhere. So how can you, so it means you need to verify the integrity of all the pointers, uh, and then you need to, to tell from, from the data memory to tell what's normal memory and what's actually return oriented programs, and that has been proven to be difficult. A lot of people work on this, it's a big uh, field of research, and uh, it's, not, it's not trivial. Okay, so, um, <coughs> um, conclusion on, on this, basically software data station, it's, it's kind of difficult, right? Uh, so we see there is no, uh, no real, uh, so those are just examples, but uh, there have been other uh, systems proposed for running on desktop computers. Um, sometimes it's working, sometimes people try to reproduce and have trouble. Uh, because they just use side effects of execution, and there have been some attacks on other systems as well. Unlike crypto experts advise you against designing your own uh, crypto system, I would kind of advise you against trying to build your own uh, software-based attestation system or use any, actually. Um, I mean, software-based attestation can be seen as an obfuscation mechanism, can be seen as a hardening mechanism, right? Uh, but you should not really rely on it for 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 giving really, really a good proof of integrity of a system. Um, so uh, that was more or less to motivate the fact that, yes, we, I think we really need some hardware support for, for trusted computing, right? We can't really, um, like self-checking software uh, is, is not um, providing any very strong security guarantees, right? Um, <coughs> okay, so is there any questions so far? I'm going to move to hardware support. Um, No? Is anyone, anyone did already play with some self-protecting software or self-checking software? <laughs> Is it really, was it really working well? Or yes. <laughs> Were there some real attackers against it? Or? This? So you knew exactly what was so in the data memory. I would erase, but I, it was erase everything that was, I mean, the stack was very, at the, almost the beginning mm -hmm. of the progress, and you just erase everything that, that, that exists. Mm -hmm. But did you? It's, it's very difficult to inject the error piece, mm -hmm. because your stack is very limited. Okay, and so you know what, what kind of system was that? It was a small embedded system. Like, a, like an AVR as well, or yeah, similar? Like Okay. Yeah. Interesting. But then um, <coughs> maybe you can prevent ROP, right? Maybe you can prevent ROP uh, because you still need some 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 memory somewhere, right? Uh, but then if you do this on so the idea of software based attestation like that is to do it while the system is running on long life system, right? So you have some states to keep of your system, right? Oh. Yeah. So so then you send, then you limit a lot the state of the system, and you know exactly what should be in the data memory. Right? So you don't have a heap, for example. No. So you don't have much into the stack. No. <laughs> there is not much into the data BSS. You know what's there. Okay. So that that kind of comes back to almost a secure boot, right? No, no, because if you okay, or or you know exactly the state that is in the system. Okay, interesting. And um, what if you would have malicious code that overrides your routine in the previous stack? Excuse me? So could there be like a malicious code that overrides the routine in the previous stack? And the stack won't be clear anymore. The new program memory will be uh, wrong. No, but then it hides itself. If it's mm. a malicious code before uh, restoring the memory, it's first, ah, uh, no, okay, yes, you're right. Mm. So, so basically, it assumes that the, the software routine you have that's doing the self-checking of the memory, it's there, but it's flawless as well, right? 
Uh, were you using timing for verifying the... But so if you don't use timing and if you clean the memory, then what, so what prevents me from modifying your codes that is in your system and to um, actually keep my stuff in the data memory? Right? So, so the assumption is that your system is compromised. So my code is running on your system. How do you, how do you guarantee that my code is not still putting stuff in the, in the data memory? that your code should erase it, but that I modified your code so that it doesn't erase it anymore. So you do the checksum against the, the program memory on the complete data memory? I do checksum on the program memory and on the data memory hmm. that I know. But the data memory is filled with randomness then, as well. It's fed with, yes, let's call it randomness. So on this randomness, how do you generate it? Because I've been thinking a lot about this problem, actually. Yeah, <laughs> So, so because if, if you generate the randomness on the device itself, uh, that means you have the key to generate the randomness, right? Yes. So if you have the key to generate the randomness on the device, maybe I can, and if you don't check the timings, maybe I can do the checksum over um, data that's generated uh, on the fly, right? So that I can still save some space for, for my own malicious code, even in data or in code. Right. So that, that's back to the to the other attack, right? So back to this, right? I, I try I try to find solution for that. Right. Actually, the, the story is that um, I, I did this during my PhD. On my uh, PhD advisor told me, oh yeah, you did this uh, attack, so on. So no, it would be good to find a solution. So let's there are some solutions, but they, okay, let's do better, right? So we try to do so, something secure. Uh, I never managed. I only found attacks. <laughs> okay, so yeah, but I think in general it's difficult because um, so either you have to fill the whole memory with randomness, but then um, if you want to generate this, okay, you have to send the randomness to the device, but then you have to assume that the device doesn't rely on some something else, someone else. So if you don't have timing verification, uh, you may have this device. So it may communicate with something else, right? Unless you have a very dedicated bus uh, where there's only one device. Was that the case, maybe? But then if, if, if you are not uh, one-way communication with the device, if it's over a wireless channel, for example, or a network, then you may have this device to collude with another one, right? So, so that they could share um, the randomness together and compute the checksum, uh, two of them at once, right? No, but then they have a unique randomness. Each. Each device has a unique okay. randomness. I mean, and you verify all of them at the same time? No. Ah. So you verify all of them, and then once you get all of them verified, you know that they are all correct, right? And, but if there is one that gets, doesn't answer or that is compromised, then you don't know anymore. Then you know that that one is not. Yeah. Yeah, but you don't know for the other ones because then they, they can collude. Oh, it's a tricky problem. Oh, we can talk about it maybe offline. <laughs> okay, cool. So I didn't convince you that you need hardware support for it. I'm a bit sad. <laughs> okay. So um, trusted compute with, computing with hardware support. So, so this, is, this is, I think, the way to go. So sometimes you don't have hardware support. And then you, I don't think you can find perfect solution without any hardware support. Um, Fine, but that's, that's as I actually say uh, here, it's uh, belief, right? Uh, sorry, here, belief, right? <laughs> uh, I, maybe one day, or maybe in some specific case, in some very clear conditions, you can actually have a perfectly secure system. <clears throat> okay, so, so the hardware-based trusted computing, so basically it relies on some hardware to provide some guarantees. The guarantees that you can have are the following. You can have uh, you can prevent booting a modified image, right? So this is typically done by secure boot. You can prove the integrity of the software that is running or should be actually that started on the system, right? So this is attestation. Uh, so there you can att attest the, the boot chain of a system, right? And you can do this remotely sometimes. You can do remote attestation uh, relying to, to know what was executed on the system. Um, then you can protect 
some secrets from a modified operating system, from a modified system, uh, and that's called sealing. So you're going to seal some secrets to a given state of the system. Um, and that's typically what is used by, um, by uh, BitLocker to, to protect the, the keys uh, for uh, this encryption. Um, <coughs> and then um, you can use it to provide identity, to, to authenticate a, a system. So let's start with a static root of trust. So the static root of trust is basically uh, a measurement <coughs> of the code at uh, loading time. So when the code starts, you get some properties. So the first example is what we get with the TPM. Uh, so the first version of the TPM. So the TPM, we'll see that in, in details, but basically what it does, it's hashing the code before loading it. And then it stores this hash in uh, TPM registers. So on registers on the TPM. And they perform what we call the extend operation on, on this. Um, <coughs> um, and then this hash can later on be, be used as a proof of the status of the system. Uh, another example of static root of trust is a secure boot. Uh, so, so the secure boot is extremely common in embedded systems. Um, so it's basically using almost always, I mean, it's using a fixed bootloader. And most of the time, this, very often, this bootloader is in the mask ROM. So the mask ROM is, uh, if you were there yesterday, I showed some pictures of a mask ROM. That's a memory that is really um, manufactured inside the processor and cannot be changed, right? It's hardwired. Uh, so if you have this hardwired bootloader into uh, the system, and if that bootloader contains a public key, right? Uh, then you know um, you, you can load code that is coming from a flash or a disk or any other uh, non, uh, volatile or non-volatile storage. Um, and then when you load the code, you can verify the signature uh, of the code. And you know that you verify the signature against the public key you have in ROM. And therefore, you know that this code has uh, been signed with this, um, uh, with this key. Uh, and then once you verify the signature, um, you can ex execute it if the signature is correct. If the signature is not good, then you stop execution. Or maybe you can have a recovery mechanism. But pretty commonly, we call this a brick, right? <laughs> That's the, uh, what happens when you play with your smartphones, you, then you get a brick, right? That's uh, pretty common. Um, on talking about smartphones, um, Secure Boot is used a lot in smartphones, for example. Uh, and, um, they are very often locked down uh, because the operators want to protect their network. Uh, they don't want you to modify the smartphone, in particular the baseband, uh, which is the communication processor. Um, they will have uh, subsidized phones. They want to pretend, pre prevent you from sim, sim locking. They want to prevent you from breaking the sim lock, which basically um, constrains you to, to stay with one uh, vendor, one uh, operator. They can provide value-added services. Sometimes maybe they have to comply with regulations. <coughs> And uh, well, mainly the, 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 the customers of the phones, uh, mainly are the manufacturers and not really the end users, even if this is changing a bit. Um, <coughs> so, um, um, do I uh, wait? Let me check a second. Just want to check in. Huh. Yeah, because I modified my slide on um, open office crashed and I, I lost one. <laughs> okay, it's not a big deal. I can do without. Um, <coughs> so the problems we have with static root of trust um, is, um, <coughs> so let's start with this one then. Uh, so secure boot, so in general, uh, so this is an example of a, of a, of a chip of a smartphone. Um, um, uh, basically, there is somewhere, so you probably don't see it, uh, there is somewhere a memory. Uh, so there are processors, and there is an SRAM, and I don't find it anymore. So somewhere there is a mass chrome memory, uh, and, and uh, it's booting the, the system. Um, so that one doesn't make much sense with... Um, uh, okay, so... Um, <coughs> sorry, I got a <laughs> small problem with my slides. So the problem with static root of trust, we'll see an example of that, uh, is that it's only verifying the static information. So it's verifying only the, the code at the loading time. So it's verifying the code when it loads it. Once the code executes, then it doesn't 
provide much guarantees, right? Um, it's difficult given this. Uh, it's not because you got a secure boot first uh, that your system is um, trusted, right? You give you good indication that it started with something good, but it might have been compromised after that. Um, and the thing is that it could have been compromised. You can think if you reboot the system, then it's going to be back in a good system, in a good state, right? So you have a secure boot, so maybe you boot your system and after a few months, it gets compromised. And say, okay, now it's compromised and if I want to do some secure, some sensitive operation maybe, and get a trusted reading from an IO or something, then I can just reboot the system, right? So I'm going to reboot the system and because I have a secure boot, it's going to boot into a trusted state, right? But the problem is that you can actually have systems that are going to boot securely and get exploited at every boot, right? At every time it boots, it's going to be immediately compromised. Uh, this, is pretty, this is exactly what is doing uh, many uh, jailbreaks on the iPhones, uh, or some, uh, some jailbreaks on the iPhone. So it's executing secure code and then it's loading some untrusted, code, untrusted data that's going to compromise the system again. Um, so here is an example. So you can imagine of a, a smartphone being uh, like that. Uh, a smartphone has a bootloader. So this one typically is in mass Chrome or in some flash memories uh, sometimes. And, and this is going to execute in place, right? So when you boot the system, it's going to execute this bootloader. And this bootloader um, is going to load the kernel or some often another bootloader. Uh, but then at some point it's loading the kernel, it's loading the kernel into memory, right? So you have this in memory. Uh, and then the bootloader verifies a signature before executing the kernel, right? So you could change the kernel here, but that's not going to execute. So once you ver the, the verification is, is okay, you are going to execute the kernel. And this kernel is going to load the, the whole system. Uh, typically it's loading a daemon from memory. And then uh, this daemon executes, for example, as root, verify the signature, the signature is good and then it's going to execute this daemon again. Okay, once we did this, then this daemon is going to access a configuration file, and there the configuration file is not signed because it's not code again, right? Um, and this configuration fi file cannot be signed anyway because uh, it's changing all the time, maybe it's changing depending on the user, and you can't sign it on the device because on the device you only have the public key. If you have the private key, you just have to break into and get the private key and sign everything, and that will be over. Uh, so you can't, you can't actually sign this, right? And this, this config file is, contains some data that is crafted so that it abuses a vulnerability into this daemon, right? And this daemon that is executed as root gets compromised, and then, um, and then you, you broke the security of the system again, right? Um, so this is very uh, typical uh, attack that you can find on a smartphone. Or, or I think it applies to any kind of system that, that is based on a secure boot, right? Uh, most systems that process some data, uh, especially if they process data automatically after boot, they can be compromised uh, like that, assuming there is a vulnerability, right? It's not, uh, it's not obvious to find. Um, and it's surprising now that on, on, on the iPhones, uh, the really the customer, I mean, there is a kind of a tension, right? The, 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 you buy the phone, you think you own it, but you are, it's not like a la laptop, right? You, you are not allowed to run software you want on it, right? So Apple knows which software is good for you. Um, uh, so basically, like uh, it was said um, uh, this morning by Bart on the smart card, you are the attacker, right? Uh, um, the, so you would expect that you have a computing device for you, and you would expect that um, there are some security mechanisms that are there to protect you, right? Uh, but actually, it's there to protect the, the manufacturer and not really you, right? And, and you are not just allowed, so you buy a computing device and you're not allowed to run the code you want on it, right? And that's kind of shocking. And if you want to run the code you want on it, then you have to attack the system, right? And, and because Apple is so popular, they have so many um, customers, there is a huge amount of attackers. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and so they, they are maybe among the most secure systems, right, the iPhones. Uh, they, they really, um, if you look at the security features they have there, uh, every page of memory is signed, uh, there is a lot of obfuscation in the system, it's very difficult to attack. Um, okay, um, but nevertheless, there are still some exploits coming out, so that's, that's uh, kind of impressive. Um, another example 
uh, that uh, is a real uh, example, and it's kind of funny. Uh, is this uh, secure boot from? Uh, so this is this is from. Uh, this is a part of uh, the mask ROM from the, the chip of a smartphone, right? And um, so this is this is the function that loads certificates, right? So there are a set of certificates uh, inside the, the mask ROM, and those certificates are used to verify the signature of the second bootloader, right? So this is the IPL, the first bootloader. On, on this function that is uh, loading the certificates, it's look, looking up some uh, fuse bits. So fuse bits are configuration bits, if you want, for the processor. And there, um, it's actually, depending on some fuse bits, it's going to fetch either what they call a commercial uh, set of certificates or a governmental set of certificates. Right? So if you have those fuse bits set, it's going to allow one government, I don't know which, uh, to use its own uh, certificate its own public key to, to verify uh, the integrity of the system. And um, that allows that government as well to replace the firmware of your phone uh, from the complete firmware of your phone from the very beginning of the boot of your phone. And um, yeah, that's, that's funny, right? Because uh, uh, that government can sign all the, the code on your phone and, and get reprogrammed completely the phone with its own uh, modified firmware. Okay, so, so to conclude on Secure Boot, um, it's good to prevent booting untrusted uh, images. Uh, it's the under the control of the, most of the time, under the control of the owner uh, of the key, right? Uh, whoever is the owner of the key. Uh, in general, it's the manufacturer, or maybe the operator, or the um, integrator sometimes. So in this, this smartphone um, chip, there is like uh, keys for several vendors, right? Um, <coughs> Uh, but the, the, the secure boot in itself it doesn't tell much about the runtime status of the system, right? Uh, it's not because it started secure that it's going to be secure all the way, right? Because there are software vulnerabilities, because there might be mistakes, and on, um, on maybe at some point you don't verify the signatures anymore, and so on. Uh, typically in Android, for example, um, uh, you can activate the debug mo uh, developer mode, and then you can install any applications, right, for example. Or you can uh, uh, boot your phone and, and reinstall it with a complete uh, custom image. That's that's no, it's possible. Right? Uh, so you can jailbreak it uh, easily. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, any question on that? No. <coughs> so um, now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what you can do with a TPM. Uh, what um, what's the features you have uh, with a TPM? So um, TPM, uh, so it's made by Trusted Computing Group, which was called before Trusted Com Platform Alliance, and was called Pala what was used. They were using the, even the the code name uh, Palladium. Uh, so it's a group of industry uh, that actually promotes uh, standards for more secure computing. Um, <coughs> The TPM is a chip that you have on the motherboard. And this chip um, is uh, used to uh, do several things. Um, uh, so for example, it's used for, um, for different features, in particular for in Windows Vista, it's used for, for the BitLocker. Um, <coughs> so the Secure Boot um, authorizes uh, only signed software to, to execute, but the TPM in the default, uh, the normal uh, use, uh, is providing trusted boot or verified boot. Uh, on that, only take measurements of the code that executes. Right? So it's not going to prevent anything to execute. Uh, it's only going to uh, log, if you want, make a secure log of the execution. Um, uh, in in uh, the recent uh, computers with the, the, the last some of the recent windows, they have been activating secure boots, uh, where they will actually prevent you from executing uh, untrusted systems, which can be problematic for for booting Linux, for example, on the computer you bought with Windows. Uh, I never played with it myself. Been told that you can deactivate it from the from the BIOS. But that's true on Intel computers, right? On desktop computers. If you have a ARM-based computer, like a, wi a Windows a phone or tablet, then you can't really do this. <coughs> uh, 
So, um, uh, to uh, achieve trust, we need to have uh, trust at the beginning. Like we said with the secure boot, we need a root of trust, right? Um, on, with the TPM, it's relying on the BIOS to have this, what we call the core root of trust, which is the initial code that is going to run on the system uh, from the BIOS. And this code should be immutable from, from a raw memory. And this one is going to be the first to execute, and it's going to measure the next software, right? the next piece of software that's going to be to execute. So often it's like modifiable BIOS code, uh, BIOS code in Flash. It's going to uh, load it, uh, make a hash of this, and store this hash into, um, into the, the TPM. Um, oh, it's working, basically, this first uh, core root of trust is going to load uh, the code from the BIOS, compute a hash for it, re send the hash to the TPM, okay? And then the next, uh, this piece of code is going to do the hash of all the option ROM. So the option ROM is uh, the piece of code that is provided by, for example, PCI Express cards, Uh, so that they can be initialized. So basically the BIOS is, is loading all the code from different peripherals, executing it. So before executing it, this is going to be hashed and sent to the TPM, right? And then once this is done, it's going to load uh, the OS loader, the so bootloader, for example, uh, Grub, uh, maybe. Uh, and this, uh, this code is going to be uh, hashed again and sent to the TPM, and then the chain should continue, right? So the, the, there is a version of trusted Grub that's going to verify the integrity or measure the integrity. So we talk about measurements in a, in a TPM. Uh, measure, the measure the system and then report it, right? So you see that never here uh, we prevent execution. Uh, we never prevent execution of, of, um, of some code. It could be possible to do it, right? So it's possible to have, in addition to it, uh, a secure boot, but that's not the main goal. So those TPM registers, uh, so they are, they are called Platform Configuration Registers, PCA. Um, <coughs> they are used to store uh, those measurements, those software integrity metrics. And, um, a, a TPM has at a minimum of 16 uh, PCA, and they are used to record uh, each, uh, I mean, each TPM is used to record a different aspect of the, of the set of the system. For example, you have one for the for BIOS, one for the bootloader, one for the kernel, etc. Uh, but each TPM, each register can store multiple measurements. And the way it's working is working with a, with a hash of, uh, staking only, storing only a hash of the, of, the, of the code. It's not doing the hash itself, right? It's going to receive the hash from, from the software. And when it's um, actually uh, storing the hash, it's not storing directly the hash, it's doing an extend operation. And this extend operation is basically um, hash chain, right? So you, When the TPM receives a hash, the last measurement, it's going to concatenate it with the previous PCR value, and then it's doing the hash of all this, and then it stores the hash into uh, the, the TPM. Um, <coughs> so uh, because we use this, it means you can, do a, you can store an unlimited number of hash on the, or more, more um, you can extend an unlimited number of times uh, the hashes of the system. So the PCRs, there are somewhat shielded locations in the TPM. The TPM is protected, has some level of hardware protections. There have been attacks on them. Um, I think they, they are made with some level of protection. It's not actually required uh, by, um, I don't think it's a requirement from, from the uh, TCG to have some hardware protections, but most of them, they have some level of protection. Um, Okay, so once you have those uh, PCR values, so those values in registers, you can actually uh, report on integrity. So reporting on integrity, um, basically you can, software can have access to uh, those registers, so you can read those registers. You can, get the, um, you can get the TPM to sign the registers. So you can, so the TPM stores the register, the register gets you an information about the state of the software that was started, And then this information about the state can be signed by the TPM, right? On, on that key, so the TPM has several public keys and private keys. Uh, on the private key that is used uh, to, to sign uh, this, um, uh, those TPMs, those, those registers, 
is unique to the TPM, so it identifies, allows to authenticate the TPM on the hardware, and that uh, is signed by the uh, manufacturer, right? So you can verify the chain up to the manufacturer. So there is a PKA uh, like that. Um, <coughs> so we said that this allows to uh, provide uh, authenticated boots, um, that uh, you can verify uh, that the system, you can remotely verify, so there are protocols for doing remote attestation uh, using this uh, feature of the TPM. Uh, it doesn't guarantee a secure boot, um, I said that already. Uh, so those registers, they can be used as well for seeding data. Right? So seeding data, what does it mean? It means that um, some key is going to be um, released only or used only when uh, the PCR, the, those registers, are in a given state. Right? To be in that given state, they need, you need to have started the system um, in a given order with a given version of the, of the, of the, a given version of, of the software. And if ever you did boot with a different kernel, for example, the PCRs will be in a different version, in the different, um, will have a different value and the TPM will uh, not uh, unseal uh, uh, the data, right? So it allows to bind some secrets to the state of the boot of uh, the computer. Uh, this, is, this is used by BitLocker, to the, the disk encryption uh, system from uh, Microsoft to, to, uh, to prevent, um, uh, to prevent uh, some kind of attacks where you boot the, device, the, the system with a different uh, kernel or modified, uh, if you boot on a USB stick, for example, or something like that. Um, <coughs> so a few facts that uh, may be obvious uh, for some, uh, or maybe uh, obvious at this point, is that trusted computing will not uh, do a lot of things. Right? It's not going to prevent uh, software vulnerabilities to be exploited. Uh, it's not going to prevent design errors. It's not going to prevent coding errors. Um, it doesn't help at all, at all for that. Um, if there are some vulnerabilities, they can be abused at any time, right? uh, including at runtime. Um, doesn't prevent exploitation of any vulnerabilities. So there were, um, um, well, I guess almost everyone is old enough. <laughs> so in the beginning, of when they created this uh, trusted computing thing, everyone was very afraid that they would completely lock down all the computers and that you couldn't run anymore like your own operating system or modify your system and so on. And uh, that it was that all the computers would be completely remotely controlled by Microsoft, etc. So it turns out not to be like that at all, uh, at least for uh, so far on, on, on desktop computers. Um, okay. Um, some, some of the limitations. So we'll see a few of the limitations with uh, trusted computing. So one, one question is where do you stop, uh, where do you stop the verification of the code, right? You, you're going to do this um, uh, attestation, right? You're going to extend the hash of the software, so it's okay for the BIOS, bootloader, kernel. But at some point, do we want to, to verify the complete integrity of the whole, all the applications? Uh, on, on, and do you want to verify maybe, okay, kernel, operating system libraries, fine. Uh, applications, okay. But shell scripts, uh, just-in-time compiled code, I don't know, that becomes tricky. Uh, JavaScript you load from web pages, I don't think that that's working very well. All the data interpreted, uh, all the data at all, I don't know. Uh, that works on maybe on a small embedded device, but not on a desktop computer. Uh, but even if we want to go to some level of uh, verification, uh, there are some problems. Uh, for example, if, if, you, if you, your BIOS bootloader and kernel are more or less always starting the same order, right? But once you start to use uh, the computer, you may um, actually uh, use different applications in different order, right? And if no, you want to extend those uh, applications hash to, to, to the PCR, that's fine, you can do it. So you can imagine that the kernel is going to verify the integrity of each application running and send the hash to the PCR. But the problem with the PCR, with this extend operation, is that it's a hash chain, right? So if you do the hash chain, but you swap some orders, in the chain, then the value at the end is different, right? So now if we boot and we start the mail application and then the web application, on another day we start the web application and then the mail application, then the PCR values are different, right? And then if, for example, we seal the data with those PCR values, then it doesn't work anymore, right? 
And if, if you have a desktop computer on your big organization, you want to verify the integrity of the computers, you have a server, it's going to do some request for remote attestation. It's going to get a signed version of those PCR registers, and it's going to have those, those hash values. He doesn't know how to recompute because you can't possibly verify. When you verify the remote attestation, you are going to recompute locally the, the chain, and you are going to verify that you obtain the same final chain value with the same software version, right? But if you have a different, if you have a different order of computing the hash, uh, then you don't know how to recompute this, right? So you have a problem here. So this problem is addressed by IMA, Integrity Measurement Architecture, which is basically, um, it's basically a, a, a way uh, to actually uh, collect all the hash, right? So it's a protocol, it's an architecture, uh, and then it's going to, um, to keep the hash of each executed program, store this in a big XML file. So we heard like the previous lecture that XML was dead, but it's still used in some places. Um, and basically, this XML file can be returned uh, when there is an attestation request. And this XML file can then be used to recompute efficiently and to verify the final hash value, right? So um, I'll show you an example of that. Uh, uh, if I get this. Uh, okay. Ah, on the wrong side. Okay. So this is uh, this is okay. This is just an XML file, right? And then uh, this XML file contains um, the contains the the, regi the register numbers, right? And then the hash value, the SHA one. Uh, we heard SHA one is bad as well, but okay. Uh, but I'm not sure you can really change this now. Um, boot aggregate, init, and then you see all the um, the hash of all the. Um, uh, all the code that is running, okay? And then this is, at the end, there is the values of uh, the PCR registers, right? So I don't know why it's uh, zero. That shouldn't be zero, right? Okay, so it's, it's a fake. It's an example I got from, from their website, on, okay? And then at the end, there is a signature uh, verifying this. Okay. Uh, oh, no, I lost my slide where I was. Okay, so um, uh, so so this uh, this IMA is is uh, is not really is not a joke. <laughs> uh, so there is actually uh, some support for that. It's been some, it's a standard no by the TCG, and it's even no in the in Linux kernel. So there is a it's in the mainline kernel. I don't know if there are many people using it. Uh, like most of the trusted computing things, but I think that, I mean, if I would be a big organization, I would like to make sure what happens in the desktop computers of secretaries and so on. I would probably deploy something like that, right? Maybe take some, some efforts, but uh, that would be uh, something uh, probably to do, right? Because then you can detect if there is some malware running, maybe, or these kind of things. Or know that there is no compromise to some extent, again, because even there we will not go to uh, hash the JIT code or the JavaScript or these kind of things. Okay, <clears throat> but uh, we are back to uh, the runtime run status problem, right? We said, or I said, uh, that we had a problem with, uh, with the runtime status of a system. And the runtime status means what? We, we start with, only with IMA, we, we only get the hash of the software that is run when it's starting to run, right? So we don't know, um, uh, we don't know uh, if it's getting compromised at some point later on, right? Uh, excuse me, how long do we have, how, how much, until which time? Uh, 10, more 10 more minutes, okay. Um, so uh, for that there is uh, Intel TXT. So this is basically um, the same problem as before, and this is static root of trust, okay? And now uh, Intel, they actually have this um, trust exec execution technology, Intel TXT, and the idea is that, okay, I cannot trust, I cannot ever trust the complete integrity of the whole system. It's a very complex system, very complex computer with a lot of stuff. I can verify the integrity at the start, but maybe at runtime, time, I cannot clean all the stacks, for example, and I cannot uh, know all the runtime status of the whole system. So 
Uh, instead of that, we, we know there are some sensitive operations we want to perform. On those sensitive operations, uh, we will do them in a protected environment, right? In an enclave uh, where we have code that is going to run and is going to be protected in a way. And, and this is what we call trust, uh, dynamic root of trust measurement, right? A, a DRTM based or um, a dynamic root of trust mechanism. And the dynamic root of trust mechanism, so it doesn't rely on the security of the BIOS, option ROM, and so on anymore. So we don't need to trust all this. We only, when, when we launch some operation, so ideally it would be a virtual machine, this is going to be protected, right? From the rest of the system, right? Even from the administrator or from the hypervisor or anything, right? It's going to, to run isolated and protected. So the vision of Intel was to do this on, um, with virtual machines, right? To do this, um, uh, like you had a TXT enabled hypervisor, and then you had some secure VMs on top of that. Uh, actually, TXT um, was more or less designed for this. There is some support for it. So basically, there is what we call the S init code that is starting, right? When you want to do, so when you want to start a TXT code, uh, then you will have some environment here, and then you do this S enter operation, and then it becomes protected from the rest of the system. It's running, and the rest of the system that can be malicious cannot actually interfere with this. Um, this is, so there is a mechanism for that with some code that runs into the processor. It's configuring the platform, preventing DMA and so on. Um, and, and then it's going to reset uh, of the registers that are higher values. And it's going to use and store um, the S init code, then the VM code and so on. It's going to extend this uh, to those registers. And then you can use those registers as you were using uh, the, the low value registers. Uh, for doing uh, remote attestation of that VM for unsealing data uh, inside this VM only, right? So you may have like uh, some um, protected data you want only to access from there. Um, do we have? Yeah. Um, so for example, you can imagine that you have um, a virtual machine that uh, you launch on your computer and that will allow you to connect to the VPN of the company, right? Uh, only if that virtual machine is not compromised, is, you are going to, uh, to access to that uh, VPN or to that environment. And the VPN will not let you in if you, if you cannot prove the integrity of your VM and prove that you are running under TXT, right? So that's the ideal case. Uh, actually, uh, if you look at, at Intel TXT, there is, I know, one implementation of it. It's called Flickr. It's a very cool paper from uh, the people at CMU. Um, <coughs> Uh, people that were at CMU because they are not there anymore. But basically Flickr is using this and, and they made a um, real implementation of it. It's very complicated to use. It's working on some given hardware. And the, but the main um, limit of it is that uh, first there is a performance issue. It's pretty slow to, to, to launch this protected environment. Uh, and then <coughs> this protected environment cannot be interrupted. Right? So it has exclusive access to the, to the system, and then you can't schedule the task, right? You can't schedule this as, as a normal process. So it's going to be protected, but only have exclusive access on the whole computer, and then you cannot switch it. So this vision of having uh, multiple VMs like that is not working at all. Right? It's impossible. Or you have to switch them down independently, encrypt the memory before you switch to another. So this is, this is not feasible. They, they, made a, they made a demo on using this to store the private key of uh, SSH daemon, right? So you have the SSH server, on the private key, key, it's stored inside uh, sealed storage. And whenever you connect to SSH, it's spawning a, a TXT um, enclave, right? Decrypting the key and then doing the key exchange. And then after that, it's stopping the enclave. So that's a good example of, of use. Um, so Intel, they actually came up with an um, improved version of that uh, because uh, compared to TXT, it's, uh, so it's called uh, Intel uh, Software Guard Extensions. So it's a new mechanism, um, so new that there have been a few papers one or two years ago. Uh, since a few months, there are the data sheets, but there are still no plan that I know of uh, for CPUs to support it. So I even checked today on the web page, they still say uh, for future processors. But the day where this is going to uh, work, this is going to be very good. Um, because it's going to allow, for example, to run uh, virtual machines in the cloud, uh, while uh, 
trusting only the processor vendor, right? Because the TPM is going to be integrated on the processor. So you will not have to trust Amazon for the security of your uh, virtual machines. That would be pretty good. Um, there are some, some companies doing similar things, uh, called, a company called Private Core, where they, they do uh, actually, um, I think they use TXT, I'm not sure exactly how, but they, they run all the virtual machines uh, inside, so their hypervisor is running into the cache of the processor, and they actually encrypt and decrypt uh, the memory before it's written to the main memory, right? So the memory is only decrypted on the cache of the processor. Uh, so it's pretty crazy, but apparently it's working. They've been bought by, uh, by Facebook, apparently. So they, they do this, like, all the memory in the RAM, right? It's encrypted. It's only decrypted when it's in the cache, and the hypervisor lives in the cache. Right? Apparently, they use TXT as well. Uh, so TXT, um, uh, trusted computing in general, uh, at least with the TPM, there are few applications, right? Uh, I don't know anyone. Is there anyone using the TPM apart for, for, for BitLocker? Huh? <laughs> and did it work? Yeah, la last time I tried on my Linux computer, the TPM wasn't supported or something, or there was a bug in the kernel or something like that. Yes. I'm not sure it's actually used a lot for, for that. Is Linux using that for... Some for do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, in general, they have their own uh, random number generator. Mm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, quickly finish. So there are some attacks on TPM. Uh, one is the TPM reset attack. So I'm short in time, but I'm still going to show uh, the video because it's, it's a funny one. Ah, it's on the wrong screen. So, uh, I will... Hello, my name is Evan Sparks. I'm an undergraduate researcher here mm -hmm. at the Dartmouth College. Okay, I'm not sure you will hear anything. But, okay, I'll, I'll make the... Um, so I'll make the, the speaker. <laughs> so basically, it has a computer here. And, um, and then uh, what you can see is the, the, the PCR registers. They are shown here. OK, let me just skip what he says. Uh, so uh, at some point, we see the, the PCR registers on, on, the, on the screen. They have the values that uh, basically um, are representing the status of the, of the computer. And there is the computer. And um, is actually, um, this is the TPM. On, it's in the daughter board, right, on the PC. It just put a longer cable to it. And there is, um, maybe it's not even the TPM. So it's taking a wire, and it's shorting the ground of VCC on the reset pin, right? And uh, so basically, it's resetting uh, the bus, right? So the TPM, but all the bus, it's called the LPC, the low pin count bus. And this bus contains several things, like the, the control for the fans, the keyboards, and so on. And he's resetting the TPM, and the TPM believes the computer reset, right? But actually, only that bus resets. And from that point on, if you look at the registers, uh, they all, uh, so there they're not all to zero, that's the previous uh, screen. Uh, and then he's going to launch the, um, so he's unloading, reloading the kernel module, so that it refreshes the, the uh, refreshes the, the values from the TPM. And then he's going to show that, uh, the, TPA, the PCR uh, registers are all uh, cleaned. So you don't really see it because the quality is so bad. Yeah, well, it's all zeros, right? So what it means is if you manage to reset the, TP, the PCR values to re zero, then you can extend to it uh, any value you want that would represent any state of the system you want, right? Including, so, the, the, the BitLocker, for example, will believe you boot a uh, non-modified Windows system, right? And then that allows you to bypass the security. So um, basically, the, the thing is that um, the, the TCG didn't really assume that, um, I mean, basically, the hardware attacks are not in the threat model, right? If you get access to the computer, you can do a lot more things, a lot of other things. 
Nevertheless, this is quite a simple attack, and they, they, they fix it in a new release of the TPM by simply making a, so that you can uh, the reset of the, the registers that will be reset only if there is a handshake between the processor, the CPU, and the TPM. Right? Solution is pretty simple. Uh, resetting the bus is not resetting the registers. Right? Um, there have been other problems like um, BIOS that don't actually do this properly. Um, um, on other uh, BIOS bugs. Okay, and I think um, I'll stop here because uh, I'm going to be uh, over time after that. Okay, so I had a few more things about things in embedded systems, TEE. So I'll leave that, that on the slides that are online. If you're interested in Trust Zone and want to know what it is, there are some very good slides that I stole from ASOCAN. Uh, on others, uh, stored with permission, I asked them. Uh, it's a very good uh, tutorial they gave to at CCS, right? Uh, one or two years ago, I think they have a paper, and maybe even a book now about this. It's very well done. Uh, and you learn a lot about uh, TPM, and I wanted to tell you about even one processor we made. Uh, it's based on OpenMSP430 that we modified uh, to include something like you would say TXT for embedded systems, right? Okay, and with this, I'm going to conclude uh, well, saying that basically uh, trusted computing would be great, right? Uh, there are some uses, but I think we need more. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's not used so much in practice, but that, that would be very good. Uh, it can provide a lot of good um, features. It's not perfect, but uh, yeah, a lot more could be done. And I've put quite some uh, references at the end. Uh, I still have to add more. Uh, I will add a few more, and the slides will be online. Okay, so if you have any question, thanks. Yes. Yes. Yeah, embedded systems, but so all the embedded systems that they use this not to protect you, but to protect the, the rights of the con content owners, right? The, the movies, the movies, they are already on bit torrent, but they will protect them very hard on the set top box. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. Excuse me. If I can use the TPM hardware without hardware key store, yes. Yeah, this is one of the purpose you can, well, in, in a way you can, um, so there are some keys, you can generate some keys that are on the TPM. And then you can even use the TPM to seal some keys, right? So that they cannot be accessed with a compromised system as well. So uh, in general, the TPM, they have hardware RSA, right? On, uh, I think they have, uh, so, so that the, the, the TPM can sign by itself, yes. Uh, can you uh, generate crypto primitives within inside the TPM? There are, so the thing is. Can you bring more security in the crypto service provider in the, in the Windows operating system? So it's not really a crypto coprocessor, right? It's not designed to be used as you using as a service, right? Yeah. Um, you can do some operations. I'm not sure exactly how, you, how far you could misuse it. Uh, I think you can to some extent, but uh, it's not really designed to be a crypto coprocessor. Yeah. There is no generic PPC as 11 Uh, it's not, I don't think so, no. Uh, there is uh, this own uh, protocol, yeah. Standardized. Uh, you can, I mean, the best way to answer this for, set, for sure would be to look at the, the, the protocol. It's all public. And there are some open source implementation. There are some open source emulators for it as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.